Right, yeah, so um, I work, I used to work at Brass House Centre in Birmingham, which was a big, uh, which is a huge, uh, it's the biggest language learning centre in Europe. Europe right? It used to be Europe. Europe, the world. The world. There was, there was, there was, there was <coughs> 32 different languages, I was told, yeah. at, at one yeah. time. Yeah. So we worked together there um, a long time ago, and that was a mixture of ESOL and EFL classes. Um, most of my work now is training teachers on Erasmus Plus courses or doing short-term projects abroad with the British Council. So I work a lot with primary teachers, secondary teachers, um, everywhere. Um, uh, and I also work at Marjon University um, and I teach, at the moment I'm teaching Omani naval officers, uh, teaching English to them. Um, which there is, and there is a bit of a link with writing there because probably, as you know, those of you who teach Arabic speaking learners, uh, writing can be can be an issue sometimes, and particularly when uh, you know you can be surprised sometimes by the level of their written English when you hear their spoken English, and then you look at their writing and you think, wow, there's such an enormous difference. <coughs> I'm really interested um, in, in scaffolding. Um, over the last sort of 10 years, I've got more and more interested in scaffolding as a tool for learning and as a tool for teaching. Um, and I just want to give you a few um, very quick examples of how uh, scaffolding has been important in my own second language learning experiences. Oh, I can press it over here, yeah? Mm -hmm. I'll stand over here. Okay, so um, so um, here's an here's an example of some useful uh, exposure to some language that happened through some interaction. Um, I was in Brazil a few years ago, and I was I used to teach in Brazil, and I went back there, and um, I hadn't been there for about ten years or so, and I was staying with a friend of mine. And um, I didn't have anywhere to hang my clothes. So my clothes were like all in piles on the floor. And my friend uh, has a cleaning lady who came into the room and she saw the piles of clothes on the floor and she said to me, que cabiji para pindura roupa? Which means, does anyone know what that means? Yes. Yeah. You, are you Brazilian? No, I'm, I'm Angolan. You're Angolan, okay. Well, you, you'll, you'll definitely know what it means. <laughs> so it means, uh, have you got any, um, uh, would you like some uh, hangers to hang your clothes up? And I didn't, I'd never heard the word hanger before, um, and I certainly wouldn't have been able to use the word bindura. Probably it's a word that I could understand, but it's not a word that was part of my active vocabulary. Um, but because of the context, and because she was looking at my clothes on the floor, I'll stay over here, because of, uh, because of that, I understood what she meant, so I just said, whoops, I didn't say that. So I just said, see. <laughs> and she brought me some hangers. So here's an, a, a lovely, I mean, very, very simple thing, but it's one of those examples where you're exposed to some language and you can guess the meaning because of the context. And that happens all the time, doesn't it? When we're interacting with someone whose level of English is better than ours. And it can also ha it can happen outside the class, and it can also happen um, between the students, and it can happen between teacher and student in the class. Just one more example. Uh, this one's in Chile, and we just filled a car up with petrol, and uh, someone came to the car to get the payment from us and the guy said quieres pagar in efectivo o con tarjeta meaning do you want to pay by cash or card yeah and i said oops i said in efectivo by cash and that was the first time that i'd ever said that in my life I was really conscious of the fact that that was the first time I'd ever used that phrase. It was very interesting because um, the, here, is, here is slightly different from the first one because in this example, um, the 
more advanced speaker is uh, exposing me to some language, but he's also giving me the opportunity to activate that language. So I get the chance to actually say, to actually repeat what he'd said. Um, when I first trained to be a teacher, I was told, when I did my CTEFLA, as it was then, I was told never use uh, closed questions when you're interacting with students because they limit the vocabulary, uh, they limit the, the creativity of the learners. But in fact, um, as a language learner, I find them really useful because they give you an option, they give you two options and you can pick and choose one of them. And I was kind of we were driving off in the car afterwards and I was thinking, wow, I just used that word in Spanish. You know, good, well done. You know, it's, <laughs> but it's one of those moments when you notice that you're learning something. Uh, just one more example. Actually, I said that about the last one, didn't I? Uh, another one in Spanish. We're on the, we're in uh, Santiago on the metro, on the underground, and I'm there with my son, who's kind of, um, you know, before walking age. And there's another man opposite me who's got a son about the same age. So I say to him, ¿Y cuántos mes meses tiene el tuyo? How many, how, how many months old is yours? And he says, nueve. And then I say to him, ¿Y gatilla? which is, which I didn't realize this meant this at all, but gadilla is a uh, trigger on a gun, yeah? So, I didn't mean to, do anyone know what I meant to say? Yeah, is it called? Yeah, gadilla, gadilla. I meant to say gadilla. So he checked with me, because it's a very similar sounding word, he said gadilla? Oh, no, no, that's right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he said, get there, checking that I, uh, that's what I meant, and then he said, get there, see, he crawls, he's, he's crawling. So here's an example of a little bit of um, activation of language. I'm, I'm challenged to operate at a higher level because I'm working, I'm talking to a native speaker, so I'm, my, my language is being pushed up, and, I'm, um, and I use a word incorrectly, and he uh, corrects what I've said, or he, or he recasts what I've said. So these kind of things, I think, happen masses when we're outside the classroom, when we're interacting with people who speak better than we do. Um, but interestingly, uh, you know, there's some research done by um, Ranta and Lister in 1997 and they looked at correction techniques that are used by teachers all over the world. And the most common correction technique that teachers use is this, this kind of thing, what we might call a recast. Yeah. Teacher, uh, student says something, teacher reformulates it, and then the conversation continues. That's the most common uh, form of correction that happens in class. But interestingly, according to their research, it's also um, the least effective form of correction. Actually, many, in many cases, the student doesn't even realize that you're correcting them, they miss it, um, you know, and, it, and it's gone, and nothing happens, nothing changes. And that's interesting, because I suppose these kind of things uh, perhaps work much more effectively outside the class than in the class because in a way in a classroom even with a small group like 10 15 people uh, you've got quite different levels and quite different needs and what scaffolding one learner might not be doing the same for others in the class other um, very interesting research which is which is related to this, um, comes from the work of Richard Gallen. And he did an amazing thing where he kept a diary of his experiences learning Spanish in a classroom over a long period of time. Similar kind of 
size, class size to international house. In fact, it may even have been an international house in Spain. Um, and you know, one of the things that he noticed was that when teachers corrected him on his utterances, he kind of went into a panic. So if he said something and the teacher corrected him, he was like, oh, you know, you know that feeling you get, you kind of, oh. and, and, he, and, and he felt that he couldn't actually take it on board when the teacher corrected him in the whole class setting. Um, he did, ha on the other hand, manage to notice correction that happened to other people. So when other people were corrected, he could kind of, okay. You know. So there's no pressure to speak in that moment. Because there's no pressure to speak, he was able to kind of make a note of it, and uh, it was much more effective. The other thing that he said that was very, very effective um, in terms of error correction was um, correction at the point of need. So correction when, uh, rather than like in the whole group setting, but when they were doing a fluency activity um, and he was struggling to find the words, rather than the teacher focusing at the end of the activity on problem areas of language, which is something we you know, we're kind of often trained to do. Um, he found it very useful when the teacher just gave him quickly, just fed in a quick thing that he could say instead. And even more effective than that was when the teacher wrote post-it notes. So when the teacher um, made a note, um, an observation of something he'd said and just wrote down a reformulated version of it and just handed it to him. And he found that really, really effective because he could see it. He could see uh, the language. He could really process it. So I'm kind of thinking, you know, I, I find it really interesting. Sorry, I'm just drawn to go over there and press the button. Um, I find it interesting how, you know, I wonder whether there is a place for kind of communication through writing and whether certain things can happen when this kind of scaffolding happens through writing when it, doesn't, when it gets missed in speech. So, um, just an example from my Facebook um, page. Uh, I mean, actually, it's interesting, isn't it, that the internet, there was a time, I think, when we felt that we would all be talking to computers all the time and we wouldn't be writing but in fact, written communication still happens quite a lot on social uh, media sites. Um, so, you know, here's an example. I put a picture up of myself on Facebook. Um, and very quickly, an old friend of mine from Denmark, who I hadn't seen for about 20 years, uh, wrote a comment in Danish on there. Um, and he said, um, what's happened to your black hair? What's happened to all your black hair? You can see I don't have much black hair anymore, either here or in the picture. Um, and uh, so I quickly responded. I, I kind of checked what he meant, and then I responded, can't you see that I've dyed my hair gray? Dyed my hair gray. Um, and then somebody else said, oh, you always wanted to have long hair. And then the Danish person here responded, oh, um, you've dyed it grey to match your, your shirt, to go with your shirt. Yeah. So this whole conversation developed out of the picture. And it was all written. It was all written. And I think there are certain advantages in the fact that it's written. If it, it, if it had been spoken and it had happened in real time, um, I wouldn't have been able to find that accurate way of speaking. I wouldn't have been able to find the right words. I wouldn't have been able to check what he meant by putting things into Google or, you know, so there's a, there's a real advantage, isn't there, in that kind of, I suppose writing offers us a slowing down of experience of language, which which may be very useful for language learning. 
So, um, some questions, I suppose, that come out of this are, can some learners notice language more effectively through written communication? Perhaps they can. Uh, could the act of writing something down challenge learners to notice more about the language than if they only say it? And is writing a safer form of communication for some learners? Um, maybe I should shut up for a little bit and uh, just have a quick, just a very quick conversation with the person next to you. What do you, what do you think about those, those issues? Anybody just want to share something that they... Um, I, think you're, yeah. I was just thinking about, you know, the idea of like noticing language and like mm. we were talking earlier about delays, language <coughs> feedback or, yeah. or whatever. I mean, that's part of the idea, isn't it? Like whether you can see some visual record. And like so in, real, in real time, it also depends on whether they want to focus on the message of what they want to say. And you can communicate quite a lot just with, mm. you know, the Lexus. Yeah. Mm. But the nuances might be lost. Yeah. Um, so it's that kind of argument of you know what you're trying to achieve in line with students' aims. I mean, potentially yes, they can notice. It makes it visually quite powerful. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I, I think it depends where students want to go with it. Whether yeah. it's accuracy, fluency, and their needs. If it's international English that they're trying to acquire, mm. or is it for an exam? Or is it? You know, sure. Know, but, you know. I mean, I think yeah. perhaps we have overemphasize in the communicative approach we have overemphasized this idea of getting across the meaning getting across the message and 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 some and all, I think actually lots of learners really want to know how to say things how would you say this that's a that's a common and it's 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 a common question that learners say but it's also a feeling that I have a lot as a language learner I want to know how people say it I'm, I'm not really satisfied with if someone can understand what I'm saying, unless mm. I'm like a complete beginner. Mm. I want to know the, the good, a good way of saying it. Um, so, I mean, it's interesting. Um, one of the things I suppose I do a lot more than I used to is let learners see tape scripts mm. in course books, mm. because I think that's often a real kind of aha moment when they look mm. and they see, like the kind of thing you were talking about, when they notice mm the little words and, and they notice things that they, that they just miss um, when language is spoken. Um, and something you were saying about, um, you know, saying, what did I just say? You know, when, when you're talking with the class, and I mean, the other day, I played football at work, after work, and the next day my legs were absolutely killing me and I could, I could barely walk. And, and they said to me at the beginning of class, oh, how are you, or, how are you? And I said, oh, my legs are killing me, I can barely walk. And then I just said, what did I just say? And I think that's such a useful little thing we can do as a teacher, just get them to stop and think, what did I say? And then write, see if you can write it up on the board. Um, yeah. Without writing it up though, I think going back to the first question, the majority of people, not all, the majority of people in the room won't have, yeah. won't have noticed that exactly. it picked up on it or it happened so quickly. Yeah. 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 So it's in terms well. of people noticing language in your example before about the, the um, or when you say something to a student and then you, they say it wrong and you repeat it back yeah. the right mm -hmm. way, it's not often that that student goes, so wait, what was that again? Yeah. Like some of them do, there are yeah. a couple of them, yeah. you know, but they're, yeah, yeah, they're yeah. the minority in my they experience, are. the yeah. majority. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you did then put it on the board, or it is visual, it's written, yeah. then mo most of them will exactly. actually like, go, oh, okay, that's yes. that, and write it down. Right? Sure, yeah. I think also it depends on the kind of learning training that you give. Like mm -hmm. if you encourage students to actually listen to each other, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. when they're speaking, you, you notice in classes, sometimes that when you're covering a class where you, you see t uh, students interacting and they're like really listening yeah. and so when you recar something they actually say it and they say it to themselves which is naturally what yeah. you do as a language learner yeah. so it's it, it is about the idea of maybe the primary thing is just listening more than anything is, that, is, is the key stage that you need to encourage it's like you know you've got to listen to each other I mean yeah. all the students yeah. need to listen to each other they need to listen to you and get that interaction and then only noticing can take place and whether that's written it might be the first stage but if you, it's kind of built in within the class, mm. where from 
right off the bat, you're, you're encouraging that kind of thing, and people will notice more because yeah. you've trained them to notice mm -hmm. rather than. You know, yeah, and then you get yeah. the good ones who are like, yeah. oh, she just said something, yeah. what's that word? Yeah. And then they start asking what the And then you get lots more interaction yeah. and, and negotiation, sure. with yeah. and then mm -hmm. you can really work with things. Mm -hmm. But the key thing is, no, actually, no, listen to what your partner's saying. Yeah. Just and not just anything. listen yeah. to the message, yeah. listen to the language, yeah. listen yeah. to the form, listen, yeah. you know, train, train yourself to listen yeah. and notice language. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, okay. Right, so... One, I mean, I'd like to look at some activities which kind of use this principle. Um, and one of them is a, an activity that I've been doing for years and years and years, and I, um, I probably do it with every class that I teach, and I'm using it at the moment with my Omali naval officers. And it's, and, um, it's just the idea of having, um, of having a notebook. Uh, kind of dialogue notebook and this is um, very uh, low-tech um, it's uh, you know I mean you could do it through email or you could do it through instant messaging or something but I really like the fact that it's written down and students actually have a book that they hold and they can flick through and that kind of thing um, so what happens in this this technique is that we um, we have a kind of written conversation, long-term written conversation. So each student in the class has one of these. Um, I would perhaps write them a question, give them the notebook, and then they'd write something in response and they'd give it back to me. And it's a very simple idea, but it's something that a lot of learners really, really get into. Um, and it's something that actually Maybe my life isn't that exciting or something, but I, I kind of get into it as well. I find it, I find it one of the most interesting things to do as a teacher. So for instance, here's a look, this is her notebook, Yayoi's notebook. She was a Japanese learner. She was in a pre-intermediate class. And we had a bit of shared um, experience because I lived in Japan. My first teaching happened in Japan a long time ago. So we could talk we communicated a lot about Japan in this conversation. So here's an example. Yayoi says, I think European dinner style is nice. They use height table chairs. They have dinner or breakfast sitting on the chair. It's good for my foot. I don't need to kneel down. My food can relax. Okay. So we've got a kind of great thing here that we've got a bit of data. There's some language and it's written down. If she'd said that, I would have probably just responded to it in the class and not picked up on it or, or anything. But because it's written down, it's something we can work with. And I'm not completely sure what she means. So I say, actually, I don't mind sitting on the floor to eat. I just don't like kneeling very much. When you say my food can relax, do you mean my feet can relax or I can have a relaxing meal? Uh, so I'm kind of giving her, trying to give her a couple of option, options that she can choose between. Uh, you know, something I did really like about mealtimes in Japan was that you always fill other people's glasses up rather than your own. Does that still happen? So I think with this kind of thing, um, the use as there can be a quite a useful balance between form-focused stuff and meaning-focused stuff. So I'm trying to keep a genuine communication happening, we're trying to communicate and talk about real stuff, uh, but at the same time I'm s trying also to support her language, and I'm giving her some language, I'm feeding in some language that I think might be useful for her. And I love her response to that, because she says, my foot, feet can relax, I missed spelling. <laughs> Of course, I can have a relaxing meal and my feet can relax. <laughs> Which is so, you know, I love the fact that she's kind of used both of the <laughs> examples, um, but in her own way. Yes, that still happened in Japan. Sometimes people say, if you pour by yourself, you will get married late. Of course, it's a joke. Um, so here's a learner who really got into this technique. And she was very, very quiet in class, rarely said anything at all. But when this 
lots of stuff came out. I found out a lot about her through this. She probably found out a lot about me. And I think there was a lot of learning that happened for this learner through this activity. Um, and it's interesting because I think learners often feel, well, sometimes people say, well, why, why don't you, you know, um, do, do people want to keep doing this? I mean, do they get, but they, they get really involved in it. I mean, like I always say to them, I give it back to them at the beginning of the class. I'd say, um, don't look at it now, just save it for homework because it's a homework thing, do it, do it at home. But they always, always open it up and they want to see what you've written. They always want to see what you've written. They want to see the response. Um, and interestingly, so do you as a teacher. You know, you, you wow, what do they say to does that? that have, sorry, question, does that ever sort of bleed into class so, you know, when the students are you know, looking, looking at it? Suddenly they want to talk about it later yeah. and rather than keeping it for later. Yeah, because, well sometimes questions come up like they don't actually understand what you've written or something. So sometimes people mm -hmm. ask about things like that. Um, I mean, I think there are great things you could do in class with this by getting students to kind of review it and try and remember bits. You know, can they cover up your response and try and remember what you said? get them to really kind of process the language. Um, so it's something that, that, that learners often get really into. I'll just show an example from um, the Omani Naval officers that I'm working with now. Um, so, you know, it's, it's interesting how sometimes things come up through this that don't come up in class. So it's perhaps things that people don't want to talk about, um, and this gives them an outlet for this. So. Uh, this is a learner from Oman, and he was telling me that he is uh, a Baloch. Is it Baloch? Baloch? From, originally from Balochistan, which I'd never heard of before this. So he was telling me all about um, the origins of these people. Is that place? Sorry? Is that place? <laughs> is that a place? It's a real place, yeah. Now? Unless he made it up. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, it's not a country, oh, but no, it's a right. region um, of Pakistan. Iran, and there are people who come from that region who live in, in lots of the different Middle East, countries. lots of different countries in the Middle East. So, uh, you know, so by large, people tend to be quite successful and wealthy, is that right? And he replies, in fact, they used to depend on gold mines and wealthy ground, which is in Balochistan. But nowadays, it is not an independent country because both Iran and Pakistan are trying to occupate Pakistan. That's why many Baluch are separated in different countries. Just as a normal war starts, people tend to live in a safe place. So I think it's interesting, um, you know, that there is a kind of, maybe he's never used tend to before. He's tried to use it there. He hasn't got it completely right, but I don't know. I don't know. Maybe he had. Maybe he had. Maybe. But I mean, it's it's, it's a it's a way of trying to direct learners into it to sort of give them a bit of language and give them the opportunity to play around with it. Um, now, I'm not sure what he means by just as a normal war starts. Anyone got any idea what he might mean by that? A normal war. Any war. Mm. Civil war. Sorry? Civil war? Civil war. I don't know. I really don't know what he means by that. So I ask him. Yeah, sorry. Sorry? Go I think you were just about to say it, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for filling me in on all this stuff about Balochistan and the Baloch people. I've never heard anything about it before. What do you mean exactly by normal war? So I mean, yeah, we don't understand something we can make it really clear that we don't understand and yeah I mean it would be actually be nice to have the next bit I don't have the next bit because <laughs> um, the it's students got the book um, but you know I think I'm trying to keep I'm trying to make this quite sort of conversational and I'm trying to expose him to language. I'm sure, I'm pretty sure that learner has never used the phrase fill me in on something. 
but I'm also pretty sure that he can guess what it means from the context. Um, all this stuff. I'm also trying to keep it quite, uh, although it's written, I'm trying to keep it quite um, sort of informal and, and, and spoken language. Okay, uh, so there's one activity. It's not the most exciting activity. It's not the newest activity in the world. But it is an activity that I think really um, can promote quite a lot of learning and quite a lot of noticing of language. The real strength of it, I think, is that it's individualised. So you're able to really help each learner with their needs at that point in time. Yeah. Have you experimented with um, uh, giving them guidance on how to notice? You know some learners who literally don't notice anything. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. there could be yeah. some people like writing back yeah. and forth to you all the time, never experimenting sure. with other yeah. stuff. Or when you set it up, do you kind of talk to them about what, what the purpose of it is? Or do you just no, like, let it happen? No, I haven't done, but that would be a great thing like, to do. Like underline yeah. the language sometimes, or ask yeah. them to try and use it, or I don't know, yeah. I'm just wondering. Because some I mean, people literally probably have no idea what you're doing, you know? Something. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, so, yeah, he, uh, students may uh, notice more language through writing, but there may be learners who, who, who don't even notice it when it's written down. Yeah? Do, do um, you, sorry, I also yeah. was wondering, do you, so for example, in the previous, in the Yayo's example, she yeah. said height, chair, would you have corrected that? No, I don't no. do any correction in these. Okay. Um, because I think I correct them enough in other written things okay. that they do, and I don't. So this is just supposed to, to be a yeah. chat. Yeah. I want people to yeah. keep yeah, it's the flow. Yeah. yeah. I don't want any meaningful. But yeah. wouldn't that be yeah. the equivalent of in spoken English going, Yes, I get your message, so I'm just yeah. responding to you? Well I suppose the point is that I mean, you I'd say it's slightly different, but I get your point. It's interesting. Um, I mean I'd say it's slightly different because be as it is written down, you are giving the learner the opportunity to notice it. But it could be true that, as you're saying, that we may need to do more. And one of the things I was going to say, as I said earlier, is, is, is um, to get people to try and remember what you've said, to get them to cover it up and go back through it and try and remember what was the response to that. Well, presumably you could get them to swap get them the to stories notice it. too. Well, like we create the well, we create the dialogue in a kind of role play. You can yeah, like do it as a. You be Nick and I'll be me, and this is you know. Exactly. Sitting in a coffee shop. Yeah, yeah. That's a great way of of, of sort of changing the format, mm -hmm. turning it from spoke uh, written language into spoken language. Um, I also do it a lot the other way round as well, where I might do some really kind of quick role play activity, a really spontaneous kind of thing, and then say, right, pick the really pick the uh, a challenging bit from that role play and write a five line dialogue mm -hmm. for that moment. The moment when you really struggled to say something, try and write a dialogue for that bit. Because that, that's so doing it both ways I think is, is useful. But just changing the format, changing going from spoken to written language or written to spoken. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, just have um, just say something to the person next to you. Um, I've got a sort of mission that I want to just explore a few different activities that are related to this theme. Um, actually, I just wanted to say that I'm I'm kind of using this as a learner as well. Um, I'm trying to learn Arabic at the moment, and I'm finding it really, really hard um, and I'm having a one-to-one -one class in the top mess with a guy from Jordan um, but what I'm finding interesting is that after the class we we've started texting each other in Arabic and it's often to kind of arrange the next lesson and I'm noticing I mean I'm not writing I don't know how to write at all in Arabic so I'm writing um, Arabic in English script but what I'm noticing is how 
it's a quite a nice little thing. Just having, like I'm saying things like, oh, how are you safe? Uh, um, is it possible to have the class um, tomorrow at four o'clock? That kind of thing. And he's responding to me. So this kind of thing is happening outside the class in the text messages. And I'm starting to think, actually, maybe this is the most useful part of the lesson where, where we're uh, communicating and writing. And I can just go back on them and look at them on the train. Or, you know, so it's, it's, it's about having some data uh, to explore. Right. Um, if I press that, will it go? Yes. So I suppose what we're doing is, with these kind of things, is we're fitting in with this idea, um, which comes from Stevic, uh, success with foreign languages. So he's talking about spoken interaction here when he says, Another of, another of my favorite techniques is to tell something to a speaker of the language and have that person tell the same thing back to me in correct, natural form. I then tell the same thing again, bearing in mind the way in which I've just heard it, i.e. having noticed the gap. This cycle can repeat itself two or three times. An essential feature of this technique is that the text we're swapping back and forth originates with me so that I control the content. So in a way, I mean, that's kind of like what we're doing, isn't it, as teachers? That's, that's probably, if we're working in contexts like this, that's probably our number one job. Quite small classes, we're helping people say what they want to say. We're giving them a, a better version of what they want to say. Um, so one technique which I'm not quite sure what the next slide will be, so I was quite just saying, oh, it's that one. Okay. So um, one technique which fits in with that is, is the Islamabad. The Islamabad technique, um, which, was, which was again developed by Earl Stevik uh, using quiz and air rods. So in the Islamabad technique, um, a learner, one learner in the class might talk about a place that they know really well. And so the learner might say, might choose to talk about um, where they're from, uh, Rome, say. And they might say something about Rome. And then you would use um, a quiz and air rod to memory mark what they've said. So say the learner said, uh, Rome, very, uh, very noisy, crowded uh, city. So you might say, Rome is a very noisy and crowded city. So you kind of slightly reformulate what they've said, give them a better version of it, and then you use something to remember that sentence by. So that, from now on, that means Rome is a very noisy and crowded city. And you would build up different things like that. Um, what else might we say? Let's say, let, let's say we're going to do one about um, International House. Let's do one about International House. What can you t I don't know anything about International House in London. So tell me something yeah, exciting about International House. Yeah. What? Green carpets in the start. Room. Really? Yeah. <laughs> So, all right, so that means from now on there are green carpets in the staff room. Tell me something else. Not enough, uh, what, forks? Nice. No cutlery. There's a lack of cutlery. There's a lack of cutlery. What does that one mean? Uh, green 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 and green green and yeah. and a lack of cutlery. Can you tell me one more thing? No beer at TD sessions. No. <laughs> oh, I didn't say that. And Richard Ray question about that. <laughs> That's Richard's yeah. one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. Why is there no beer? <laughs> it's a good question. Yeah. 
it? Yeah, Brenda, why is that a fire? <laughs> <laughs> is, there, is there a rule about no beer? Or uh, no, there isn't. No, no, but we want you to pay attention. Oh, okay. <laughs> Normally, TD is at lunch, so yeah. Yeah. maybe that's why. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so that can be. There's no beer. Not lunch. In training sessions, there's no beer in training sessions. Okay, so we might build up a series of sentences, and um, Earl Stevick, who created this technique, uh, used it for spoken language as a spoken a speaking activity. So you know, students could do the same thing in groups. They just need some coloured pens or something, and they could. One person could be the initiator and they build up some sentences around a place. Um, but I think it's also nice as a way into writing. Because, well, let's just quick, very quickly, let's just try and do it. You've got three sentences there. We might have maybe six or seven. Can you just um, see if you can create one sentence that links all of those things together? Just with the person next to you, you've got 30 seconds. Can you link? Can you create one sentence? Um, and the right material. That's a really lovely um, group activity to get, you know, because there's a lot of, the, your folk, you're getting the students to revisit language that you've introduced or they've introduced and you've reformulated. And, but there's also a lot of useful language that happens around how are they going to put that together? How, you, how can you make a coherent, cohesive text? Uh, you're going to probably have to add in lots of other things to make it work. Um, so I'll give you an example for my students. Um, and, cause th and this happened because once I came into class and they were talking about drifting. Do you know drifting? Yeah, yeah. 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 the crazy thing they do. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. I've never heard of it before. It's really dangerous. It's when they're kind of holding on, they're like so Yeah, it's not that. That's when they're like up on the wheels. No, it's drifting. Oh, no, no, no. Drifting is when they're hanging out and then they drift on the back. It's just round. Drifting. Oh, they're like spins. It's like skidding. It's like sliding. It sounds like it's a good topic for this year as well. <laughs> but um, anyway, they were talking about it. They were to they were talking about it. So I, I thought, okay, well, we'll use this as a. We'll see if we can create a text about it. So we did this, and we just like stuck bits of card on the board for each sentence. So here were the sentences uh, that came up, and they were all kind of reformulated by me. And then we'd do a lot of kind of drilling and remembering them. And then they tried to write them down. Um, and then I got them to try and uh, produce a coherent text using fewer sentences. And I was really disappointed by how, how they did it. Because I don't know if you find this, but often if you've kind of introduced linking devices to your students, they, they, they kind of suddenly just overuse them totally inappropriately. And for some reason, they really like moreover. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, can't think I've ever, I, don't know, I don't know if I've ever used that in my life, but they always seem to latch on to that and put it in all the time. So, I have some models. I have some moreover. We have some moreover. They were so sad that moreover never. Yeah. So, I, I was thinking. So then I, I kind of abandoned the activity and I thought, well, actually, with this group, maybe they need a bit of training in, in linking text. Actually, linking text is probably the biggest issue with writing, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Especially with, um, with some of the uh, Arabic-speaking learners that I've been working with recently. So what we ended up doing was we did it as a whole class. So I was saying, right, what, what are we going to put first? What's going to be the first sentence? Write it up. OK, what about the next? What, what's coming next? Write it up. How can we put those together? So lots of, te lots of whole class activity, questions to the students. Um, and we ended up with a text like that, which 
um, you know, it's obviously it's not the only way to do it, and maybe it's not the best way to do it, but it was a text that kind of came out of teacher to student interaction. It took quite a while to get that text, but I think it's a useful moment. Sometimes I'm not sure that students, when they're doing group writing, if they haven't got the skills already, I'm not sure that they can find them on their own. I think they need a bit of support sometimes from the teacher. Um, sorry, to Go on, do, please. You, do you write up on the board or do you have one of them? No, I wrote. Well, you, you could get, yeah, that would be great to get one of them. But it, with this example, I wrote it up on the board. So I was sort of saying, okay, I suppose what I'm doing as well is I'm trying to kind of let them into my thought processes a little mm -hmm. bit as a more advanced writer mm -hmm. than they are. Think, oh, there's something, so I'm kind of saying things a lot like, Mm, that doesn't sound quite right. Mm -hmm. How can I? How can I? Uh, how can we make that sound better? Do we need to repeat the word drifting? Or we've said that already. It's the kind of things that you're thinking to yourself when you're writing. Yeah, you're thinking to yourself often, aren't you? Oh, how can I? I need to change that. I've used that word twice. You break it up. I mean, like I think that's very useful in terms of what you said in the process, but. Sometimes you know it can be in lockstep with with the teacher, and it's important to see the process. So sometimes it's not say, okay, well, next sentence we got this one. You pair, like every everyone pairs up, yeah. and they think of it because mm. you've got IWBs, and you can write each version up. And you say, well, okay, what do you think is the best version here? Then? Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. You want, you so it goes go back into group work, yeah, and then back into the whole class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. 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 I find yeah. if I'm trying to, if I, I've done this before. Yeah. And I, I, somehow it just ends up with me kind of writing the text in the yeah, board, you know, being like, oh no, and, really and I just involved, feel like I'm involved. telling them mm -hmm. how yeah. to write it. I, and think I, feel like I still think it's very it. useful. I, mean, I use the IWB a lot for this one. Mm -hmm. because multiple versions, the versions are nice. And then they'll look all the multiple versions yeah. and see how they, and, they and then I let them kind of choose. Yeah. Yeah. And then I would actually say yes or no, actually, yeah. to that. And I would say the reason why. Yeah. And then yeah. I think it's really nice with process. I think yeah. It's really yeah. nice idea. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing we can do, isn't it? As a, there's, there's, uh, uh, inexperienced teachers are sometimes not able to realise, oh, it's time to go into whole class, or it's time to go into group work. And we can do that all the We can just do that, can't we? When we, when we know what we're doing as a teacher, we, we just get a feeling for, oh, okay, it's time to do this in pairs. It's time to do this as a, as a group. But, so, yeah, I think that's an important point that we've raised there, yeah. Um, I mean, I just want to show you this. Do you know this text? Yeah. 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 I mean, I love this activity. Mm -hmm. Happy that yeah. loves yeah. 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 It's like every standby go. What is it? This is our standby go to. It's from uh, <laughs> 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 1984. Yeah. 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 I mean, I've written... I, the reason I've started doing this yeah. more as a whole class is because of having um, the result, I, I, getting results from that which I think aren't that good when they do it in groups. So I mean, like here's an example of my Amani's. This is the way they. The, the task is sorry if you don't if you haven't seen it before. The task is to try and rewrite the text in. Uh, much fewer sentences. I think it's eight sentences, um, maximum of eight sentences. So George Orwell used to be Eric Blair, was born in 1903 in India. His father worked in the Bengal Civil Service. George went to Eton and left in 1921 and he joined the Imperial Police in Burma for five years. I don't know, it doesn't, I feel like it's not that good. Um, and I don't know, we can get learners, we can always say to learners, just do it in groups, just do it in groups, and sometimes maybe it's not enough mm. for them to do it in groups. Maybe, maybe they, need, they need a bit of uh, teaching. And so here's a text that we got as a whole class. Um, and I, I'd say, you know, we, even with something like that, I, quite, I do quite really traditional things with my students, like I say to them, right, you're going to learn this text off by heart, and then tomorrow you're going to write it out. And they love it. Well, they make, make, make <laughs> just pretend to. Maybe they just pretend to. Well, they go home and memorise it? Yeah, I get them to memorise text. 
this and I do that a lot with the um, not so much with this one actually I didn't do it with this one yeah, but I did it with the drifting test. So I say to the learners, tomorrow, the beginning of class, you're going to write this out without looking at it. It's a short text. Um, they are very used to memorising, learning text by heart. Um, and I think that they value it. And I value it as a teacher as well. I think it's a useful thing for them to do to learn text by heart. Even, I mean, obviously, there's more, there's perhaps more value in learning um, spoken text, dialogues and things, but I think even written text, there's a lot of, um, a lot of value in that. It's what you can do with it afterwards, I suppose, when it's learned, what do you do with that language? Yeah. Now that they've kind of got a handle over it, you know, how does that you know, move into different other tasks that you might look at as well? Yeah. Sure. Or other uses of the language? But I think I'm just thinking with writing, more, more so the writing than, yeah, you can, you can apply it to speaking as well, but in all the years that I've, I've taught writing, I, I don't think it's the mechanics that they, they, they find difficult. What they find difficult is the whole logic system of how mm. we organise our ideas by examples, results yeah. and reasons, and the different kind of discourse structures we have for that kind of cause and effect. And they don't get that. They just put down random sentences, even though they might be connected. Mm -hmm. And you think, okay, grammatically it's, it's sound, but actually the coherence yeah. within the development of the idea yeah. doesn't really match up. Yeah. So yeah. I think sometimes spending more time on the logic process that we yeah. would go through as a process, mm -hmm. and then you can bring in the mechanics. Yeah. I, think, I think the imbalance is we focus too much on the production, mm -hmm. yeah. but we need to sort out the the process. Process. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Be because I think yeah. there's like a yeah. kind of cognitive blind spot, yeah. isn't it? I mean, it is yeah. really hard to think yeah. in a different language. Mm. Yeah. You, f you feel like you don't have access mm. to yeah. the ideas. So, it, you know, it's often like, yeah. you know, yeah. how, what? Because, yeah, I think a lot of them stuff, I mean, like that, because I know a lot of my students, I mean, the grammar's there, the, the, they've got lovely mm. collocations and, uh, and expressions, but sit, sit down and write. It's everywhere. The whole yeah. and we like to us it just whoa, I don't get this, it's mm -hmm. incomprehensible. It's the logic system. And I think you need to spend quite a bit of time sorting out the logic, then you can get that kind of writing path. I don't know. Yeah. My feeling on it. Yeah. A bit. It's mm -hmm. slowing down yeah. I think it's about yeah. slowing slowing yeah. down of experience. Slowing down mm -hmm. of, of you know yeah. that's I think we do not take just too much not just yeah. mm. you know yeah. what can you achieve? But yeah. How how you get how do you get to that? Yeah. How do you get to that result? Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, here's an example. Uh, I'm, actually, I'm not going to show you that because it's a, but this is a, a class in Pakistan. We'll move on quickly. Um, so uh, another just another activity which I really like. Um, is to kind of create a text through writing as well. And we're not gonna do this because we're gonna run out of time. Am I okay to carry on for a few minutes? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, this activity involves um, creating a text through writing. So what happens is the students work in groups. They've got lots of bits of paper. You know the old technique of the old idea of having written mm -hmm. conversations, mm -hmm. passing mm -hmm. notes. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a, a way of using that idea to create a text. So what happens is this is, this is uh, me last um, October in Palestine picking olives. I did a day's olive, pick, olive picking in Palestine. And uh, what I would do with students is I would say, okay, you're going to ask me some questions. You're going to write about this experience, so you need to ask me some questions about it. All right. Just very quickly, write down a question that you might like. Everyone, just write down something that you might like to ask me about this. You, bearing in mind that you were imagining you're going to write a text about it. Well, I'm just doing a kind of. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> speak that version. Yeah, I did that speak. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
<laughs> While you're picking yeah. 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 So, I mean, you probably have got a lot of questions, and the interesting thing is probably your questions are all quite different. So um, what happens is each group then bring their written questions over to me or to the teacher. I would write a response and give it back to them. And then they've got to somehow process all that information and create a very short text about mm. it. I think it's important to emphasize that it must be a short text, like you know, 80 words mm. maximum. So do you write the answers yeah. to all the questions and then they... Yeah. Okay. So each group writes a set of questions. Each and you write group, the yeah, and you can do it, you just, you, I mean, it's, it, it, if you've got quite a large class, it can get, it can become very hard work <laughs> for the teacher. Mm unless you impose certain rules like you could say just one person from each group is like the editor mm. for their group so he decides he or she decides which questions are going to go to me and maybe that person also has a kind of correcting mm. role correcting the questions before they go mm -hmm. here um, you can also decide that you're not going to correct you're not going to answer questions that aren't correct mm. yeah and I, I used to do that, and I don't do that so much now because I feel so never got to the it answer. limits. <laughs> <laughs> well, you never get so you to never that get stage. To the you never get you the best role. Still yeah. there, an hour later, going, oh, no. No. <laughs> yeah. I'm leaving. So that would be <laughs> one reason. Yeah. 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 But it's also that if you say that, I hate, I hate it when students play safe because they think, oh, I won't write that because I'm not sure how to spell that word. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't want to get an environment like that, do you? So, um, um, but you could also say, I'm, I'm only going to answer, I'm only going to write one word or two words in my answers. So that challenges them to make quite more complex questions. And then they produce a text. So there's a lot of interesting interaction happening between the students. And the texts that they produce are kind of a mixture of their own language and your language so it's a sort of that's again i suppose that's what we're trying to trying to do a lot of the time and you always use a photograph as the starting point no no i mean you could just say oh i went i had a really um great weekend or i went to i went on holiday to spain or it could be anything yeah um, here's a text that was um, constructed in that way where we had a guest coming to the class um, and came to the class and spoke to the students or no didn't speak to the students the students did this questioning thing and here here is a text that one of the students wrote so it's interesting because you can really see them you can see the learner kind of struggling with bits of language <laughs> trying to make them work. Um, good. Uh, now, of course, the other way of doing that, that kind of text construction, is through recording. So, uh, going from a list, this is, this is uh, writing as a means of communication, and creating a text out of those written things. Uh, another way of doing it is having a picture and then getting the students to think of questions that they could ask you and then recording them. Mm. So get so anyone know what this is? Is it that to me? It's Totnes, it's Totnes, it's Totnes, yeah. yeah. This is where I live, this is town where I live in Devon. And every year there is an orange race in Totnes. I mean, you might think in London that uh, you know, things are pretty good, but we have the orange race in August every year, and it's pretty hot. And I actually won the orange race, the over 40s orange race. And I've got a, a little silver plate on my mantelpiece. Um, so I showed this to some students, when I was working at Exeter University, I showed this to some Chinese students. I got them to think of questions that they could ask me about this. When they 
planned their questions, I went around and helped them with the questions, they asked me the questions, and then we recorded both the questions and my answer. So we sort of built up a listening text. I then played the whole thing back to them, and they made notes, and I said, you've got to create a short text about this. Um, from those notes. A bit like CLL, almost. Yeah. 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 yeah, kind of slightly freer CLL, yeah. I suppose. Yeah. 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 Um, and I, and I, so that's, uh, that's another, I, uh, that's one way of doing it. And I like, I like that. I really like the, uh, just the, the things that come up, the things that they notice in what you say. I, I really like, I'm very keen on um, live listening and I think recording those things that you say is just, you know, you, you can do so much more with it if you've got a record of it. So one more activity, now when they've done that, here's an example of a text that some learners wrote. Uh, it's a bit difficult to read, maybe because it's a bit faint. Orange game is a very traditional game in an England village. It have a long history for about 500 years. In each year there are four groups, such as 10 to 15, 20 to 30, over 40 and over 60. In each group have 20 to 30 persons. This is a very famous game in there. Every year have many visitors to watch this match. In the game, only orange can be used and people all of enjoy themselves. <laughs> <laughs> Did I tell you what nationality this was? Chinese. Yeah. It's interesting. What was the nationality? Chinese. Chinese. Oh, yeah. Right. Isn't it interesting how we can sort of we start to recognise nationalities through handwriting as well, don't we? Mm. Yeah. But um Okay, so I'm really bad at correcting written work. I don't, I don't really, I've, I've never managed to find a way that I'm happy with. You know, I've tried everything. What do you do with students' written work? How do you, um, do you use correction codes? Do you, um, you know, just respond to the content? Uh, are, you, do you are you just positive? Um, do you get your red pen out and <laughs> cross things out? Uh, I'm not really happy with any of those things. I, I can't, I'm not, I don't know, I'm just not really satisfied. One thing I have done which I feel fits in with some of the principles that we've been looking at, certainly Stevick's reformulation model, is to actually reformulate the text. So, um, here's a question for you then. So, if you were going to reformulate that text, um, and to reformulate it in a way that's not about um, correcting, exactly, correcting grammar, but rather giving the learner bits of language that they need, because often students make mistakes, not because they, they've made a grammar mistake, but because they don't actually know a chunk of language or a word for something. So maybe here's an opportunity that we can actually give them some bits of language that they could use. So just, just have a look at it and see how you might reformulate. We'll, we'll just talk to the person next to you. How might you reformulate that? I know we're a bit over time, but I just want to just finish this. I mean, things like it have a long history for about 500 years. So you had a nice way of reformulating that, which was, um, okay. did you say? It reaches, I think it... Going back. Going back. Going back, going back 500 back. years. Yeah. I mean, I wish I'd thought of that when I, when I reformulated yeah. it, but I used something different, I think. But, um, so what I do then is I... I rewrite it and obviously there's a lot of work if it's a long text so we want to work with very very short text for this 
I think this is about 80 words. Um, so we just rewrite, rewrite it. And, but we only give them back, only give them back the reformulated version, not, the, not their original text. We just give them back that. And then I say to them, okay, now, look at the text and go back and, see, and underline everything that you think is different from how you expressed it. And they can do that if it's not too, too much time has passed and it's a short text. They can go through and they can just underline the bits that are different. Do you find that when you're doing this sometimes you're changing the meaning of what they're saying unintentionally? That's possible. Because it's Jess and I were just doing that and I realised actually I've just, because it says, could you go back a second, sorry, could you click? Yeah. Yeah. Just that last page. Okay. It's that one line that says this is a very famous game in there, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I just said, um, I completely changed it, whatever you're thinking. I said, although not famous because it's not, uh, it's very well known locally. Uh, but actually, I'm changing what they're trying to say. Maybe not. I mean, we we can't always be completely sure what they mean. That's true. What they want to say. That's. I mean, that that's yeah. That's a drawback. That's definitely a drawback. Really, but I guess we, the main benefit from what you've done, I think, is you've given a more lexical alternative. Yeah. yeah. Tried to. So the meaning is still pretty much the same. <coughs> but yeah. But I mean, we can all. We. we it's. It's difficult to do. Would you never give them back their text? No, like no, I, I, I would. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Make a big fire and see what happens. Don't produce After they've underlined, they get it back. No, so what happens is yeah, they get it back. So what happens is, yeah, let's go through. So they get it back. They underline the bits that they think are different. Yeah. Okay. Um, they talk to a partner because I think that's a useful thing as well to kind of dialogize it or something just to, to get them to actually mm. say to their partner, no I wrote it like this but he's written it like this mm. I wonder why that is or mm. so there's a lot of conversation that can come out of it and, and then give them back the original one so then they can just check what was different. it's kind of that dictabus effect hasn't it of, yeah. of comparing mm -hmm. you know, what you wrote and yeah. but it's also nice yeah. to bring about the process of like the vocalizing ideas and thoughts and yeah. you can notice gaps yeah. in, in the process of what they think that they, they should be doing based on maybe kind of cultural ideas or what they've learned before and you're actually saying well let's have a, a discussion about yeah. this and you're looking at the process nice. Yeah. What's really nice is it's all the reformulated language that's really easy. It's, it's not any sort of particular structures that you're you know, highlighting in a discrete item. No. Way. It's that yeah. real, real language that they're looking at. Yeah. So, yeah. I also think with the one that you formulated, you're you're looking at things, and I think you make a very good point about this. You're you're using the lexis given rather than changing the grammar of like really upgrading it. Because mm -hmm. the, the danger is if you if you do do it like so much that it's completely changed, and you're not looking at the kind of content words mm -hmm. carrying the uh, carrying the meaning. What happens is students get it back and they're just really confused. Yeah, right. yeah so it's you've like got to be. It's, it's basically, you're just trying to pitch it just right above their level. Yeah. And so and it doesn't have to be one. a brilliant yeah. text, mm. but it's got to be a more natural version. Yeah. yeah. Perhaps. Yeah. 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 Which is yeah. nice. Yeah. And it's something that, yeah, it's not easy to do it, I don't I, I think. It does take a while, and I, but I think it's something we can get used to. Um, and we can kind of quite quickly. It actually take, it takes me ages to mark things because I'm half the time I'm thinking, oh, you know, should I do I bring this up? Or, whereas with this, you're just trying to get inside the mindset of the learner, and as you said, just pitch it a little bit above that mm -hmm. and just rewrite it. So mm -hmm. good. Uh, Going back, just going back to that picture before, you know the picture I showed you of the... Um, olives? The olives, yeah. I've got some questions. You've got some questions? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll deal with them in the pub. Okay. <laughs> um, but I, um, I've, been use, I've been using those pictures as well in my Arabic classes. So one thing I did was I showed um, my teacher the picture, and this is like you were saying, a bit like CLL, 
but I, I told him some things I'd like to say about the picture in English. He told me how to say them in Arabic, and I recorded them. I recorded myself saying those things in Arabic. So it's things like, you know, I worked on an olive farm uh, one day only. Um, the farm was in a village near Ramallah. Uh, the name of the village was Bedlikia, that kind of thing. Yeah, it's a quite a simple language, very useful language for me, because it's kind of things that I might actually say when I go back there. Uh, I might say them tomorrow if I'm in a taxi taxi somewhere in Ramallah. So, um, so, so I recorded that, and then I tried. Then I wrote a text using the language. I tried to write all the things out. Um, and then my teacher corrected my text and gave it back to me. And now my homework, which is really hard, is he's written it in Arabic. <laughs> uh, so now I'm going to try, I don't know if this is going to work, but I'm going to try to see if I can work out how to write by, because he's written it kind of word for word. So I know that this is Anna, for instance. Um, I, yeah. Uh, so I'm going to see if I can use that to work, to work, uh, to work out some, something about the alphabet in Arabic. Um, but yeah, so that's the idea, you know, it's just this basic thing, isn't it? We, we try and say something, someone helps us to say it better, and we learn from it. Um, and I think that doing it through writing, doing that kind of thing through writing, can sometimes bring benefits that aren't there in speaking. That's all I wanted to say, really. It took me a long time to say it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.